Good afternoon. Welcome to APIS Weekly Series Webinar Series. My name is Billy Zadig, Standards of Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to APA's webpage later this afternoon. You will receive a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to the webpage where all webinar recordings are housed, as, a well, as well as a link for our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through October 2020, and most are open for registration. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by one of our presenters. Professional continuing education credits and AIA CLU credits are being offered. For AIA certificates, please send an email to Billy, B-I-L-L-I-E, at APA.org with your membership number. If you did not indicate you wanted a certificate during registration, just send me an email. Also, if you have more than one person attending this session from a central location, please contact me so everyone gets credit for attending. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Paul Hammond to introduce the presenters for today. Paul, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us virtually here at uh, Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Again, my name is Paul Hammond. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Technology and Instruction here at Rutgers, New Brunswick. And I'm here with uh, two colleagues with whom I've worked closely over the past couple of years, uh, John Kluver and Senna Loftus from Voigt and McTavish Architects. And uh, we're um, glad that you were able to join us today and we look forward to uh, presenting some of the tremendous work that uh, Voigt and McTavish has been doing over the last few years. So the nature of the educational institutions of higher learning have really been evolving over time. Long gone are the days of uh, these institutions that were focused primarily on uh, the teaching of uh, religious ministry. Uh, quickly, they started to uh, expand their missions to uh, cover areas such as law and medicine. And then later on, uh, including things such as teaching, agriculture, the hard sciences, engineering, and art. Along with the changes in the areas of study, there have been constant changes in both the methods and materials used to study. Um, although we can't help but note in this uh, image right here that the nature of the students themselves hasn't necessarily changed uh, as evinced by that student on the lower left who is not quite as captivated by the activities going on right in front of them as one would hope. Um, as part of these changes, the facilities, of course, need to keep pace. And while it may be relatively easy for an instructor to change a course offering, uh, add some new learning objectives or material, it's not always as easy for the rooms and buildings that house these activities to change as well. And what happens is that rooms that are completely adequate or perhaps even uh, state of the art one year will quickly find themselves uh, surpassed and out of date uh, within the, just a couple of years. So one of the goals of this presentation today is just to talk about uh, some of these basic trends in higher education and the creating of a technology uh, uh, technology-based learning environments, um, understanding the trends so that we as facilities uh, related uh, people both from the administration side and the design side are able to um, prepare and provide the backbone that's needed to support these educational missions um, and also for maybe even get uh, lucky anticipate some of the upcoming trends as well and make our jobs just that a little bit easier in the future. Is that possible? Let's see. We can try. <laughs> That's possible. Um, so the first question is, who are we, who are we designing for? Who is the current student? Um, so today's student is a Generation Z, and that really is this large gap of students that are um, the age range of nine to about 23 currently. Um, and sometimes the best way to think about who today's student is or what today's generation is, is to look at the past and compare them to see what the differences may be. We all know the millennials. Um, we, we got, you know, we received from them Facebook, Twitter, and the selfie, right? Well, um, Gen Zs are um, 
also equally adept at working with technology, but instead of being seemingly consumed by it, they are using technology to work for them and they want to um, live with it and work with it as opposed to living by it. Um, another thing, another big factor in separation between millennials and Gen Zs are Gen Z students have lived through potentially two different uh, recessions. And so they've seen their parents struggle and, and work with the economy. Um, and so as a result, they're, they're fiscally minded and they are actually making a choice to attend college or not. So they are in it, um, they're making a commitment to education. And so as designers and educators, um, what thinking about what that environment of education looks like um, plays a, a big uh, factor in a young student's decision to go on into college and what college choice um, they make. Um, so as designers and, edu and uh, educators, we're thinking we'll take you through a few case studies of different projects that uh, show the evolution of education and learning environments, um, and particularly how that technology is developed and um, integrated throughout. So picking up on, on this theme of how are these changes manifested in our learning environments, uh, I would like to start by uh, looking at a comprehensive facility study that was done for the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And the theme for this uh, portion of the presentation is how renovations to an existing facility are reflecting the pedagogical shift uh, that has been occurring at uh, the law school in particular, but uh, through higher education in general. Uh, this is a campus um, that the University of Pennsylvania that's obviously large and the law school has a basically one block portion of it uh, extending from 34th Street uh, up to 35th mm -hmm. Street bounded by Chestnut Street and Sansom Street uh, on the sides. It is very much a landlocked institution. As part of this uh, facility study, we were looking at not just the space planning aspect of it, but how do we help them uh, expand their mission and outreach uh, beyond the immediate um, needs of the, the law school student. Uh, they are very much looking towards goals of collaboration, not just among their own students, but reaching out to other academic um, uh, fields of study, uh, the greater law school community as well, finding ways to bring more people in and to get the kind of collaborative learning that is central, uh, both in the learning environment, but also our work environments as well. So it was with that eye of how are we shifting the old facilities that were very much focused on a presentation of facts, uh, kind of delivery, you know, picture like some of the old movies like uh, the paper chase uh, presentation of facts and recitation of, uh, of memorized material to that more collaborative environment. So thinking about the law school itself, you can see this one block um, environment that had uh, definitely grown and expanded over time, but they now were at a point where they could only grow up or within. Um, the courtyard that you see in the center is very much part of that environment. They do not want to disturb that. Uh, but what they realized is that there were a lot of inefficiencies in the existing spaces that they had. So it became a mission uh, for this feasibility study to think about how do we make the most of the space that we have. There was a stated goal from the, the dean at the time that he wanted to be known as the no crane dean. I did not want to be seen as building an addition on this. I want to work with the space that we have. So the study uh, identified five um, distinct uh, areas of focus uh, that were intended to be uh, executed over the next decade. Uh, this study was performed in 2004. And sure enough, over that next decade, those projects were uh, completed uh, and to such a level of success and focus that it was then quickly expanded to take on some additional steps. We are now at the point where we've completed eight phases of work at the law school uh, that have taken about 15 years at this point. So what are some of these projects and how do they reflect these trends in education? Uh, the very first project that came out of the study 
was the conversion or the, the renovation of their four large lecture halls that each uh, held over 100 students. Uh, these were built in the 1960s. Uh, I'm sure you're all surprised by looking at that image. Um, and they pretty much still look that way today. This, these are black and white photos that were taken right before the renovation. So, um, but you can see some of the, the challenges inherent in trying to teach in a space like this. Uh, it was a square shaped room, but it was with the teacher located in the corner. So as a result, that professor was very distant from some of the students. Uh, they did not have uh, extensive uh, screen space to either write or display. And as you can see in this image, they could only choose one at a time. Um, and it was an environment that was not uh, strong acoustically, was not welcoming, and was completely inaccessible uh, to those in wheelchairs. The conversion kept within the volume of the space that uh, was presented there. Um, both in terms of the height and the ceiling and the, the floor and the, the tiers that were there. So uh, in a way, the, the envelope got smaller because we had to drop the ceiling down below the, the vaulted coffer and built up new tiers on top because what we were doing was turning the space 45 degrees to provide a proper teaching wall uh, for the professor. So now there is a U-shaped configuration of desks, again, tiered to help with sight lines. But this new configuration allowed not just the professor to be closer to the students, but also to allow the students to see each other uh, and to allow more of a dialogue between them and the professor. So that it was no longer a, I am presenting to you or you talking back to me, we could now have conversations across. So that new configuration is very important in the collaboration. Another key element of this had to do with the, the windows and the natural light. Um, there were a couple small, almost porthole windows uh, that were there uh, that basically did nothing but remind you the fact that you were in what basically otherwise felt like a dungeon. Uh, so new windows were added, uh, opening up onto Chestnut Street. So now we're bringing in natural light. We're giving students views out into the into space uh, you know, of the city itself, give you that uh, little mental break every once in a while, and uh, just basically create an environment that's much more warm and welcoming and a place that people wanted to be instead of had to be. With a change like this, acoustics was also important. And this is another critical trend in education is acoustics. It used to be that acoustics was something that was never really thought about but the ability to hear uh, the professors and each other clearly and uh, without distraction is uh, crucial to the, um, to the learning environment. So these windows were built uh, in a, a triple glazed, double uh, storefront system to provide maximum uh, sound blockage from the street. Uh, but at the same point, the materials of the room were uh, actually uh, tuned to provide a good acoustical benefits. It was a combination of absorptive wall surfaces and reflective wall surfaces that um, really helped to reinforce the spoken word. So you did not have to use uh, microphones in order to be heard despite the size of the room. The uh, other key component to this project was the incorporation of technology. And this wasn't just a matter of let's throw projectors and screens and microphones and outlets in. It was really thinking through how are these done in such a way that it will support the goals of the professors, but not encumber them or get in their way with how they want to teach. So the ability for screens to drop when they want or wanted to raise up when they aren't needed, the ability of the lectern um, to be present in the center of the room or off to the side. Uh, again, giving the, the professor the flexibility to teach the course the way they want to uh, was very important. Uh, one thing that we'll point out uh, when you look at this image is, and you'll notice this as a continuing theme throughout the projects, is the relationship of the projection screen uh, to the teaching wall or the, the writing wall on there. This was actually a, a lower ceiling than we would ideally want to have if this was new construction. We were, again, we were dealing with a, an envelope that was there. But ideally, you would project up high so that you can still write and, and do board work down low at the same time. <clears throat> 
So equally important to the classroom is providing um, collaboration space outside of the classroom. So this, this master plan was the first time that Penn Law said, we are providing spaces for students to collaborate. And it was unprogrammed space. So it was dedicating actual square footage for just student use, right? Which is, it's a big move. And so a lot of these spaces, um, they showed up phase two through the last current phase um, was just breaking out, finding space within the complex that John pointed out to be dedicated for them. And, you know, this really means a bunch of different spaces that are differently sized can accommodate anybody from groups of one to two to 16. And the requirement for these rooms was that they were open, that they had plug and play capability for technology. So each room is equipped with some sort of display um, and a, a, a port to plug your own laptop in um, to, to cast and meet. Um, uh, and again, these spaces do not need to be very large. So you could, you could accommodate a two-person room in a two-person room, ADA accessible in 75 square feet. You need 100 square feet for a table of four. Just keep that in mind when you're, you're thinking about spaces. Um, when distance learning came into play, the Penn Law was very much interested in collaborating both internally, but also to other remote students. Um, they have some campuses on, and elsewhere, other remote locations. And so the classroom, the built classroom, all of a sudden was, was not a limitation. So incorporating technology, being specific about it and planning for it allowed for this connectivity. So you're thinking about microphone placements, cameras, and displays that then easily allow for that connectivity and collaboration beyond your, your, your footprint in your permanent environment or, yeah, this first uh, environment. Um, one aspect of Penn Law, their curriculum, which we're seeing more and more um, other universities and uh, sign on for, is this idea of recording both audio and visual um, classes. So for them, it gives the students that miss class an opportunity to see the class that they missed, or gives the opportunity for any student to review the material afterwards. And that, that planning for and um, integration and uh, thinking through the needs allows for all that technology, we're talking microphones, speakers, cameras, writing surfaces, projection screens, all that being integrated um, in a classroom that doesn't require um, uh, destroying any existing character that you might have. So for instance, this is an existing classroom that we renovated that has this recording capability. Um, it was an existing reading room and it doubled as a boardroom those four times a year that the board uh, meets in, the, in this space. So carefully planning for that tech lets you retain that historic character if your existing spaces might have that. Um, so by way of a, uh, let's see, the football-shaped table in the center, that front table, by way of bringing in or out panels of that table allows for either the boardroom setup, the conference room setup, or the typical classroom setup that you see on the right. Um, so here is a side-by-side uh, -side photo of what those spaces look like. And you know, it's, it's a little tough to see, but you can see on top of the table, the locations for the microphone plugins, the, the charging stations, the bookcases that existed, those are um, infilled with acoustical panels, acoustical material that then's fabric wrapped to allow for a, that absorptive material that John was, was talking about in the previous Giddes classrooms. Um, but then again, still having this, um, the presence and the character that, that existed in that space. The most recently um, completed rooms, uh, this are three of their largest classrooms in the Penn Law complex. This is an historic photo of the, um, what was the reading room um, in Silverman Hall, the oldest building. It was part of their library that was once housed in this building. Um, you can see the, uh, you know, the, the very beautiful ceiling, the ornate plaster ceiling all the millwork, which actually is plaster on the walls, all the columns and everything, all the pilasters, that's actually plaster and molds. Um, 
painted very dark, probably a faux bois to look like wood at the time. Um, but what you can see, if you, if everybody can look at that rosette at the, the, the very top of the image at the, um, the groin vault, if you keep your eye on that, you can see what a 1980 mm -hmm. um, construction project had done for, these, <laughs> for those spaces. So they made three classrooms out of two of those large reading rooms by putting up a partition wall, and that's actually a glass panel at the very top that's letting you see that rosette into the larger volume. Um, but what these rooms were lacking was this careful integration of technology, and it wasn't working for them. So you were getting visible, um, uh, visible issues. They, they had acoustical issues. It was hard to see, hard to hear. The lighting was poor. Um, the very high spaces of up to 22 feet to 30 feet at the very, very top um, was, was tough for these rooms. They couldn't hear each other. The mechanical distribution was loud. Glare was an issue. So the writing surface and teaching wall uh, where the projection screen was, the short throw projector, and then the writing surface, it was impossible to record um, these classes, let alone if you were actually live in there to hear each other and have that communication across the rows, which you know, despite the layout for the case study classroom, it wasn't working for them. The new projects recently completed um, shows the, the rethinking of these rooms. So what you're seeing here, which is starting to help with all that, is a new uh, distribution for the HVAC. So um, evenly supplied airflow, quiet airflow, um, which previously was audible, now it's quiet. Um, new lighting, so new LED lighting. You have the cove lighting at the very, very top to light the ceiling and get some reflection down. There's down lights. The rings have both down light and up light to then again accentuate the volume of the room that you're in. Um, there's uh, acoustical material, acoustical plaster actually in the curved, in the, in the arch ceiling, in the vault. All those panels are acoustical plaster and where there are uh, wall surfaces, also acoustical plaster. The, uh, the new shades, the new shears are acoustical shears. And I should say that they're shears because of the new LED array uh, teaching wall, there's no need for blackout anymore. So you can have a complete presentation and have it be clear, have that legibility without any need for blackout. Um, the furniture is in this flat floor room um, each, three, each of the three rooms were fit out separately um, to accommodate different needs. So this room is the flat floor and it has any type of arrangement you might need to accommodate up to 60. Um, and again, that this is the, a view similar to um, both the pre-construction photo and the, the historic photo. This is the new partition wall, but we treated it with uh, molds and replications of what the existing architectural details were to then continue that symmetry around the room and really heighten the importance of these rooms, um, which is something that during programming, the students really wanted to maintain. Despite the shape that they were in and the, the performance of those rooms, they loved these rooms. So now they're actually working for them. Um, this is the second of the three rooms. This one is a uh, fixed classroom. So this one accommodates in this generous horseshoe shape, a, a particular class size for them, which is around 56. Um, and again, same general treatments for the room with the acoustical materials, the teaching wall, um, but a different occupancy. And then here is their largest classroom size. This accommodates 83. Um, and you're, you're seeing a lot of the similar details from the other classrooms that John was talking about in terms of uh, sight lines, the accessibility, giving accessibility to the back of the room as well as the front of the room, allowing for um, that, that communication and that collaboration despite having a classroom of 83. Um, and then here is the last view of that, again, showing the teaching wall. And because we, were, we had this, um, this ceiling height in this room, we were able to locate the LED array above the writing marker board surface down below. Uh, this is a detail shot of that teaching wall. And this was a this was a intentional detail that we had from the very beginning. We wanted to, um, by reorienting the rooms, we wanted to maintain 
that historic detailing of the of the room and not destroy it by putting up a teaching wall in front or burying any of that. So actually in this room, you can see the, the hearth of the fireplace behind that is intact. And by um, assembling, a, a designing a new steel assembly to house both the LED array and the marker boards down below, with then some picture lights to accommodate the, um, the visual capture recording, um, ends up leaving the room in its, in its most pristine character as we, as we could. So moving from uh, the University of Pennsylvania Law School and the uh, renovations of their existing facilities, we're now going to shift the case study to Drexel University, just right down the street, and uh, talk about their LeBeau College of Business, which was a new building that was uh, completed about five years ago for um, uh, the, the goal of taking two uh, facilities in two different buildings that they had and consolidating it into one uh, that really met the needs of a modern uh, and, and growing business school. Uh, so uh, the two buildings they were in were built in 1965 and 2001 and uh, it was kind of uh, a pretty standard classroom what we uh, might even refer to as 13th grade uh, <laughs> referencing the just the, the the simple chair configuration there it was not supporting their educational mission in any way so the new facility was intended to provide a variety of teaching spaces and you know the upper portion of the building was where uh, the faculty offices were uh, and keeping a lot of these these uh, public and educational spaces at the lower floors with the with the larger footprint uh, and while the the program did include some more traditional spaces such as a lecture hall and a auditorium and, and typical classrooms with flexible seating in them. The goal really was to also provide some new types of educational experiences that they didn't have before, such as the case study classrooms, uh, cluster classrooms, uh, a financial trading lab, and a student collaboration room. So let's spend the next couple of minutes just taking a look at some of those and, and what that meant for them. All of these classrooms were really intended to pick up this goal of creating a learning environment that helped prepare the students for their working environments after graduation. So the focus was on flexibility and collaboration and that um, cross-disciplinary uh, learning that, again, these are themes you're hearing throughout this presentation. But it was, what are the kinds of environments uh, that will work best to, for those? So this case study classroom uh, will look very similar. It's similar to what you saw in the Penn Law. Again, very successful in terms of um, that collaborative uh, learning experience from each other. We're you know, moving away from the, the model of the teacher has all knowledge. The teacher's role now, uh, and this is sort of occurring throughout all education levels, is to help the students process the information that they're able to gather on their end to make sense of it and to open up the, the learning experience to how to make the connections between what they're learning um, and other experiences that might not uh, immediately appear to directly apply. Um, so similar to uh, those Penn Law classrooms, you're seeing a lot of the, the same concepts here, the integrated technology into the, the student desk environment uh, the learning environment that has the, the presentation material up high, the writing surface down low, the incorporation of natural light, uh, the use of the sound absorptive surfaces to help um, with the acoustics. Uh, an, another uh, type of classroom that they had here is what was called the dinner theater or the cluster classroom. Uh, and this one at first blush looks very similar to the case study uh, in the sense of sort of the centralized uh, lectern position for the professor with the students ringing around. But if you look at the desks that are there, you see a combination of both tables and uh, more counter type um, uh, surfaces. And the intent of those is that you can have a presentation such as this where everyone's facing to the front of the classroom uh, shown on the plan on the left. But at uh, points in the, in the lecture or the class uh, where it's appropriate, the students that are at those fixed uh, like counter type tables are able to just simply turn their seats around, 
pull them up against those uh, oval shaped tables and now enter into a small group discussion. Um, I think we've all been in those learning environments where the, the teacher wants you to do the, the, the group work and all of a sudden the tables start getting dragged around and there's this horrible cacophony of, uh, of metal on uh, vinyl tile that um, is very distracting and disruptive. It, this allows that kind of quick change in a, in a way that's not disruptive at all. Another type of space that was critical for this educational environment and that we're seeing an increasing demand for are these small group uh, breakout rooms or collaboration spaces in a variety of sizes. These are spaces that can be um, incorporated into like a small group seminar use. So they could be part of the registrar's schedule uh, or they could be scheduled for groups to use. You know, the, the, the law school journal or the business school journal is going to uh, do a planning meeting and they need a space so they can reserve this room or it could be just left open so that uh, a couple of students want to work on a project together and they see this room is open and they can go in and use it. And it's set up with the technology in such a way that it can be an internally focused use, just the people in the room, or they can call up you know, outside resources on the screens that's there, you know, hook up their personal laptops to it to um, you know, search the internet or whatever and then project it up on the screen or set it up in a video conference format uh, as well. So now the, the collaboration and the learning can actually extend outside of that immediate space as well. Um, there are also the specialty spaces. Uh, the trading lab um, is another one. And again, the idea with this was flexibility, that it was set up in such a way that it wasn't just desks set up row after row after row facing a screen, but the ability to hold both lectures in the space or small group collaboration or just independent use of the Bloomberg terminals by the students uh, of the business school. And then again, program specific spaces such as a behavior lab um, that allow them to uh, do very specific studies that are supporting their courses. But then on the opposite side, very flexible spaces such as uh, what was initially designed as a student business incubator space. I mean, and this was kind of like the the WeWork model of come in and grab the desk that you need and uh, you can do what you're, whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, the goal with this space really was about flexibility and it proved so uh, successfully flexible that they've even since re-envisioned how that space is being used. Um, so that again, you've got very specific uses in some portions of the building, but again, very flexible uses in others. Uh, one other theme that is uh, part of uh, these learning trends has to do with cross-disciplinary learning. Uh, this is the uh, music library at Vassar College, uh, Skinner Hall. This um, space is, uh, is in a gorgeous neo uh, sorry, gothic, neo-gothic collegiate building um, that had um, kind of off of this reading room, the kind of old school listening booths. Uh, I think we can all imagine, even if we didn't go to music school, we probably took foreign language lessons at some point. You put the earphones on and you're speaking into the microphone and it was this almost like scarring experience <laughs> of, um, of, of trying to learn in that kind of environment. It was a space that was not being used by the school anymore. So they said, how can we turn this into an environment that is more welcoming, more uh, collaborative, and allows us to really leverage the space that we have. So what we created was the what they called the listening classroom. And the, one of the first things you'll notice about this space is its geometry. This is a low ceilinged room, pretty shallow, kind of long. Uh, but what it allowed us to do was to create a, a real a sort of media and teaching wall uh, across the front there. Um, there's an immediacy between the professor and the students that are there. And the one of the keys here also was, despite the fact that it's flexible tiered, uh, sorry, fixed tiered seating, that there's still a degree of flexibility. The chairs are on wheels instead of pivots so that they can move, turn around, raise the seat to talk to the people behind them. You see the keyboards here that can be uh, put away and stored so that it can go to a, a more standard classroom use. Um, but one of the keys about it is, um, 
this idea that more than one department can use this and it's set up to meet those needs. It wasn't just for the music department. The anthropology uh, department uh, uses this as well where they'll bring the class in and they'll listen to uh, audio recordings of um, indigenous cultures and uh, things like that. Or the film uh, course may come in uh, to watch movies in, the, in a fully immersive uh, environment as well. And this cross-disciplinary aspect of it actually has a, a wonderful side benefit of allowing um, budgets from several departments to be combined to create a single project that might be better than each department could afford on its own. Now, I realize every institution has its own funding sources and models that may not pertain, but it's something to keep in mind. We've seen that done successfully on several of our projects. And I talked over that slide as well. <laughs> there you go. Proof that this is a live presentation. <laughs> So uh, again, my name is Paul Hammond, and um, we're actually coming. Uh, we're uh, in a room right now uh, that we that we designed um, with Voight, Mc, Voight, Mc, Voight and McTavish Architects, um, and um, it's a project that actually grew out of a large scale planning effort at Rutgers. Um, our current president, uh, Robert L. Barchi, uh, MD, PhD, announced in the fall that he's uh, stepping down after his tenure, which began in 2011. And uh, his tenure here at Rutgers has really been uh, a transformational time. Um, he's overseen uh, the integration with the former uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey uh, to create um, uh, the Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences. Uh, we have, over the, uh, his tenure, we've more than doubled in, in our size. Um, we used to be a uh, just over $2 billion a year operation. We're now at $4.5 billion a year operation. Um, and we, uh, during that time, during his tenure, have gone uh, through also a, um, a, a tremendous uh, building phase. He's overseen, um, his administration has overseen uh, construction of, uh, of uh, new building space across all of the campuses, um, Rutgers campuses in New Jersey. But I'm here to talk to you about a specific uh, uh, project that grew out of um, master planning and strategic planning uh, that he uh, began at the start of his tenure. Um, and what you're seeing here is a, a quote from a physical master plan that was uh, published in 2015. Um, and it's, it, it helps uh, to get at the heart of one of the central challenges in, um, at Rutgers New Brunswick. So um, Rutgers New Brunswick is, is uh, it's actually in the New Brunswick Piscataway, um, uh, divided between New Brunswick and Piscataway. And like many universities, it, uh, it came to be over the course of over 250 years actually. Um, but it went through a number of different types of iteration. So um, what you're seeing here is our current geography, which is the remnant of our former, essentially the, the remnant of our former college structure. So the yellow CAC that you see in the middle is uh, the College Avenue campus. Um, really used to be the former Rutgers College, which uh, until the 70s was an all-male uh, university. Uh, and the green on the bottom, you see uh, Douglas and Cook, which actually used to be two different campuses. Uh, the Douglas um, uh, College was the uh, former uh, women's college. Uh, Cook was the former agricultural campus. Uh, so that was the uh, agricultural school uh, or college uh, of, of agriculture was, um, was located there. Uh, the Livingston campus in blue up above was a, uh, an access college, uh, which began in the 1960s. And the Bush campus was our uh, college of engineering. Uh, and also a lot of our sciences were located there. Um, beginning after the, um, uh, in the uh, 2000s and, and continuing forward, we moved from a college structure to a, uh, a modern school-based structure. So we now have uh, really 14 schools in New Brunswick. Um, and consequently, uh, students are able, they, they live on any one of these campuses and they can take courses on any one of these campuses. So when the master planners came in, they, um, they did a, uh, an extensive um, uh, really travel study uh, to look at our student, um, the way that our students are moving across our campuses over the course of the day. 
So what you're seeing here is, um, is a representation. It's a, a modeling platform that they created that they affectionately termed uh, called the Swarm. Uh, and this shows uh, student movement across the different campuses over the course of a specific day. Uh, so this is actually the School of Arts and Sciences residential students were able to uh, filter down uh, uh, so we could look at just uh, a specific school or specific cohort. Those are the School of um, uh, Arts and Sciences students uh, on a particular Monday, uh, just residential students. So it gives you a sense of the the um, the scale of the of our travel challenge in New Brunswick, and um, we we built with these planners a, a data set that we've uh, kept up over since 2015. And we look every semester at the travel patterns of our students and try to um, identify trends and see how we can reduce the amount of unnecessary uh, course related travel. One of the uh, things that the that the planners suggested that we look at to reduce travel is um, the possibility of using technology uh, and tra more traditional distance technology as a way to address uh, travel challenges. So um, in uh, Rutgers uh, Camden and Rutgers Newark, uh, the law school, which is uh, there was a campus in, in Camden and a campus campus in Newark, they began uh, experimenting with more traditional telepresence. So this is a kind of a standard conference telepresence uh, setup um, so that they could offer their courses across campus uh, between Camden and Newark. Um, in New Brunswick, however, we were looking to uh, address travel really at a, at a high level uh, and, and really have a, have a, a, a major impact. So um, our uh, course uh, travel necessitated at the time when we began this project, uh, 260,000 course uh, student course related trips per week. Mm -hmm. So that's the scale that we're trying to address. So. Uh, uh, doing these sort of smaller scale distance projects weren't really uh, going to make much of an impact for us. Uh, but we did some more research. Uh, we actually looked at a um, what our colleagues at the University of uh, Pennsylvania uh, Business School, the Wharton Business School were doing. They also have a campus in Philadelphia and a campus in San Francisco. Uh, and they began experimenting with um, te more traditional telepresence at a, at a larger scale. Uh, so these rooms um, seat uh, 40 to 50. Uh, so we, um, this was sort of getting closer to where we wanted to be, uh, but we really were looking to um, address our standard uh, lecture size courses, which for us is about 275 students, um, and look for ways to use um, uh, more traditional distance technology, but to um, really tailor it to our specific needs and at the scale that we needed. So again, looking at um, the ability to split a traditional lecture, lecture size course across two of our geographic campuses. So we, um, we worked with uh, uh, VMA and uh, technology, uh, um, really uh, very good tr uh, technology integrator to, um, to look at not simply um, room design, um, and not simply technology design, but how to really integrate um, the distance technology, the design of the rooms, the architecture, and how these rooms uh, were going to be used to create an immersive type of experience. So this was really a, a, a great design challenge and something where uh, VMA was a, a, a great partner. Yeah, and so because we, you invited us on some of those tours, we, we went over to see Wharton together. We were able to really understand what the desire was um, for Rutgers. And so the, the first challenge was to identify two existing classrooms, one on each of the two campuses that met all those parameters that, that you were mentioning. So one being the occupancy, so to accommodate at least 150. Um, a high ceiling, as John said earlier, the higher the ceiling, the more capacity you have for a writing surface at person level with then projection up above. Um, a wide front of room. So uh, with the immersive technology, you need a lot of screens. So you want to be able to have that real estate on the front of the wall. Um, so that was, that was the first challenge was to find, find two rooms on each campus that would accommodate this, but then also find two rooms that also had the potential to 
um, suspend that belief or that immersion aspect where you could see these two rooms potentially as being identical. So essentially taking two fraternal twins and trying to make them look um, both in person and then when projected as identical twins. Um, so I should say on the, the plan, on the far left, you have the right Lori room, which is the room we're, we're in right currently, um, or the right classroom, I should say, that we're in currently. And on the far right, you have the Lori classroom. So um, you're getting the two different room plans that they look in shape similar, but not quite, right? So the trick then was to somehow uh, through the technology, the camera placement, the angles, the, the detailing, the finishes, getting these two rooms to actually appear um, as uh, closely, um, closely together as we can to create that immersion aspect. So I'm going to walk you through um, really how these rooms are designed uh, and, and how they um, how they function. Um, and again, this was uh, iterative work that we did with VMA and with technology integrators to come up with during the design process um, what we thought would be this. This is a unique design. This had never been done before. Uh, so we were we were really uh, experimenting. Um, and we came up with what we thought would be the most successful base design, and then we began to iterate on that even during construction. So I'm going to walk you through um, what we came up with, both from a, again from an architecture and design standpoint, and then from a technology standpoint, to give you a sense of how these rooms work. Um, so we borrowed the terms throw and catch from our colleagues at Penn. Um, so what what we, what you're seeing here is what we call the throw room. And this is where, um, this would be an example right now, this is where the instructor or instructors are uh, live and they're speaking, um, presenting to a, a live classroom. And across the front of that room, uh, you see three different screens. So the, um, and I'm gonna show you how we uh, designed uh, from a technology standpoint, um, the different, what we call scenes in these rooms uh, so that instructors have the flexibility to use them in different ways. What you're seeing here is um, what we call the Q&A mode. Uh, this is sort of the base uh, when, this, when the classes begin. Many of them are in this mode right here. Um, so what you see is on the left and the right, the catch room, which is the, the other room, the, the, the room where the students are seeing the professor virtually, um, is captured the left and the right. The students in those rooms are captured with cameras in the front of the room and are projected to the other room. So the students in the throw room are seeing their, their fellow students in the catch room face to face on the left and the right. So the cameras essentially split the room in two. They pick up half on one uh, with one camera and project on one screen, half on the other. The, um, the cameras also, and again, I'm gonna walk you through these uh, scenes. We have the ability to stitch the left and the right uh, on the center screen. So this is a, would be considered a, a, another scene. Um, and then the instructor can show his or her content on the left and the right screen. So this is for the uh, uh, ease of viewing for the students in the throw site. Uh, so again, the, the students are still seeing their, their classmates in the other room, they're stitched up in the center, and the faculty member can show his or her content um, on the left and right screens. We got some feedback uh, during the initial semester that uh, some faculty uh, they wanted a uh, time where they could um, have the, the students focus and not be potentially distracted by their classmates. Uh, so they wanted the ability to um, essentially freeze uh, or not project the, the students in the other site. Uh, so we gave them that ability. So this just shows the uh, content being um, uh, projected on the left and right screens. And of course, we have the ability to, um, to print present um, video lagless uh, between the two sites. I moved to America 12 years ago with my wife. So this is from a technology standpoint, that's a, a tremendous challenge, right? So we have uh, the uh, increasingly our faculty are using multimedia. Uh, they have the ability to present that media uh, to their to their live class but it's also streamed lagless to the other room so that there's, uh, there's no delay and those students have the exact same experience. Um, in order to facilitate uh, faculty um, who are using uh, 
either written material or wanted to uh, to um, write something down for students to see, uh, we incorporated uh, visualizers, uh, digital visualizers, um, which again can be projected to the other room. So it's uh, instead of writing on a board and having uh, students maybe not be able to see that well, uh, we have the ability to um, to to show uh, the, those visualized images uh, and to stream them across uh, between the rooms as well. Uh, another piece of technology that we uh, that we used uh, that's been tremendously successful is a company called uh, Mersive uh, that, that we're using. Um, this allows us to uh, connect every student, all 275 students, uh, can connect and have their content from a cell phone, uh, tablet, um, uh, laptop projected to the screen. And again, this goes between both classrooms. So the students at the remote site can connect, uh, the students at the, at the live site can connect, and the uh, faculty member can, uh, can present the student work, work that they might be working on in the lecture uh, to both classes, again, seamlessly. Um, we also have the ability to have the uh, left and uh, right of the other room uh, shown on the left and right and the content in the center. This again uh, allows the, um, the, the other site to be shown at a, at a, a larger scale. What the back of the room looks like, this is still the throw site. So this is what the faculty member sees in the back of the room. So again, there are three screens across the front. There are also three screens across the back. Uh, the screens on the left and the right um, are picking up the, uh, the students in the catch site. Um, so this is so the faculty member is essentially looking directly at um, the, the live students and over the heads of the live students is seeing the students at the other site. So if a student has a question, uh, he or she can raise his or her hand um, and uh, an array of 32 microphones in the ceiling, uh, directional microphones pick up the student questions. Um, the, the, the faculty member can see that student and that's then, um, the, the faculty member has the ability to answer those questions uh, from both the live site and the remote site. On the far left, you'll see uh, a, a confidence monitor so this is so the faculty member can see um, him or herself uh, in, in a confidence monitor to make sure that they're centered properly on the, on the, on the um, screen. And then in the center, they're seeing uh, their content. So this is a, a kind of confidence as well. If we flip now to the catch room, uh, the, the, the central difference here is in the catch room, the screen comes all the way down to the floor. Um, and the instructor in the, in the throw room is then presented uh, full size, uh, life size, as if he or she is standing uh, on the floor of the, again, what we call the catch room. Um, again, the students are projected or can be, depending on the scene, on the left and the right. Um, and the, um, the uh, content can be uh, displayed on either side. One of the key design uh, challenges that we ran up against was that we wanted the rooms, the student experience in either room, again, we uh, call these rooms the immersive synchronous lecture halls. We want them, wanted them to be as immersive as possible. Uh, so we wanted both rooms to see the exact same thing. So after the, the initial rollout for the first semester, we worked with the integrators to create uh, special screens um, that are actually uh, full size and uh, we worked in a, an additional projector um, and have the, uh, have the ability to present um, a third image in the catch room uh, above the, the projected image of the faculty member. So what this does is it ensures that the, uh, the students in the live audience, the throw room are experiencing exactly what, the, or uh, vice versa, the students in the catch room are experiencing exactly what the students in the throw room are, are experiencing. Again, to create this sense of immersion, this illusion of the immersion of the, the illusion of being there. Uh, again, these scenes are identical, so the, the throw room has the ability to see the content on either side, um, and the, um, the, uh, the what would now be the throw room uh, stitched up in the center. And again, this is controlled by the faculty member. Uh, they can, with a touch screen, just select the, um, the scene that they want. Uh, and this is exactly what they're seeing then in the um, throw room. And this is a, 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 a just to show you um, how hard the designers work, the, the architects um, during the design phase um, and how well that uh, uh, 
was then realized uh, during construction. These are these are live uh, or, or current uh, views of these rooms. Um, and this is the down to the finishes that were chosen, uh, the placements, the, the, the diligent work that was done with the room uh, uh, screen placements. Um, this was all realized uh, really as designed um, in, in, in practice. So this is a, a view of what the uh, throw room looks like. Uh, this is a view um, from the front of the throw room. This is the instructor presenting to a class. Uh, you can see the three screens across the back in the confidence monitor. Um, and this is then what the catch room looks like. So again, that screen comes all the way down to the floor. Uh, the faculty member is projected life size, uh, and the students in the catch room are then stitched uh, together, uh, or I'm sorry, in this case, in the throw room are stitched together, uh, and the students in the catch room can see their classmates uh, in the other room. And again, that's so that they can see them, interact with them, uh, they can have discussion, uh, the microphones pick up, um, the audio, uh, and just like the, the video um, is, is streamed laglessly between these two sites, so is the audio. So it's as if you're there in, 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 in real time. Um, and this is a view of the catch room really from the front of the room. And you can see again, the screens uh, across the back. So this is, um, again, it's, a, it's a, um, a case study of a specific challenge uh, something that had not been done before uh, anywhere in, in the country. I can say with some confidence that these are the most uh, techno uh, technologically advanced rooms in the country. Um, and it's, it's a, it was a, um, a, a really a case study in how architecture, design, technology integration um, worked hand in hand with uh, how, how these rooms would be used in practice uh, to create um, what's been a really successful project for for Rutgers. Um, so this is um, this is again the room actually that we're standing in right now, um, where the faculty member in front of the room is. That's where I'm standing right now, um, and the uh, the rooms in um, in motion look something like this. Noted, these rooms have been uh, uh, very successful. We um, we survey students and faculty after every semester. This was a survey that was taken after the first year. Um, so uh, we um, are making continual adjustments. Uh, the team here, we have a, a, a tremendous digital classroom services team. They're continuing to tweak um, the video, audio, uh, create the best experience. Um, iterating on what we have to uh, continually improve. Um, and we're doing that largely through feedback that we're getting from students and faculty. Uh, and we're gonna continue to, um, to develop these rooms as we move forward. So that's, um, that's our Rutgers project. Um, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, again, these are our uh, uh, names, titles, and email addresses if you want to contact um, any of us uh, for more detail about any of these projects. And, um, and that is our presentation for today. I want to thank you. We've kind of run out of time for a Q&A session. So for those of you who had questions, they will be sent to our presenters and they will, the presenters will be reaching out to each individual uh, person with a question for, uh, with, with an answer. So, Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join the webinar and our panelists and our presenters. Thank you so much for taking your time to do this for us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.